Welcome, lonesome travelers, to the Dog Parade. Sorry, everybody, it's Bo here, uh, just trying some new intros out. Anyway, I don't have to do a fancy introduction for this here episode. You're going to love it. Why, you ask? Because this here episode is one featuring uh, a, a dear friend of mine, an old friend of mine, and somebody that I know you love, because you've probably heard her before, and if you have, then you love her because that's how this works. I'm talking, of course, of uh, Jamie J. Sammons joining me here on the Dark Parade. Uh, she's here all the time for what you're watching, but this is the first like main episode uh, of the show she's done, and we're talking about Last Night in Soho from Edgar Wright, and it's a great conversation. We have a really good time, as we normally do, and, you know, to dive into the period clothes and how much we love the influences of this movie and the great performances and all that stuff. But I want to warn you that because this movie is relatively new uh, in that it came out within the past year, um, we talk openly about everything that happens in the movie and the movie is a bit of a mystery. So if you don't want to know anything about last night in Soho, uh, or at least not spoiled by us, then please go watch the movie. It's available on all the streaming services and so forth, and then come back and listen to the show. But if you don't care about spoilers, uh, or you've seen the movie already, then by all means plow right ahead. So as you are listening to this episode, ladies and germs, I will be on the high seas. So uh, I'm asking uh, a very special favor because I'm not going to be around to promote the show because uh, I don't think I'm going to have internet being on the ship. So <laughs> I'm, I'm basically doing a little bit of uh, pirate cosplay is what's happening. I'm going to be in a place where I'm not going to be able to, uh, to, to hit up Facebook and that kind of thing. So I'm asking you as a special favor from your old pal Bo, uh, who works hard slaving away in the podcast minds that uh, even if you've never done it before, do me a favor, share the show around because I ain't going to be around to do it. Um, so, you know, uh, let, let some people know that you're listening uh, and try to put it in front of some eyeballs. That's what I try to do when uh, I'm around. But uh, as I said, I will not be on account of being on the high seas. And probably, probably by this point, I've got dysentery or at least scurvy. I can't really say for sure. But anyway, uh, I'm really looking forward to this cruise. It's going to be nice to get away, but I'm very excited also uh, to be doing the show. And I hope you enjoy this episode. I think it's a good one. And uh, enough out of me. Let's just uh, let me shut up and get right to Jamie. So this is uh, me and Jamie J. Sammons talking about last night in Soho. Enjoy. Well, folks, as promised, threatened, uh, prophesied, uh, finally on the Dark Parade is the, uh, I don't know, the, the queen of horror podcasting, the the empress of evil. Ooh, I like it. The matron of the macabre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to th think how many more I come up with. But it's it, J.B. Sam, it's everybody, you know. Huh. Hello. <laughs> you're you're better than, at that than Duncan. <laughs> oh, I, yes, I know. I know. Um, <laughs> well, that's why I have you on, really. It's just to compare me to Duncan favorably. That's all I really want. <laughs> I don't care what movie we talk about. But let me let me say this uh, in the upfront. Um, two things, really. One is that this is a relatively recent movie. There is some uh, bit of mystery in the film. It's not just like, well, there are monsters and eventually those monsters may or may not win. Um, this is more of a, a mystery. Certainly has its roots in like Giallo and Hitchcock and De Palma and uh, Polanski, that kind of stuff. So we are going to be very brazen about talking about the plot. So if you do not want to know how <laughs> the the uh, Last Night in Soho resolves itself, then go watch the movie and then you can come back and listen to this. Uh, but you have been warned now. Hopefully twice. I ho uh, hopefully I'll remember to do it in the upfront as well. But certainly now. So that was issue number one. Issue number two is uh, pointing out because if, you, if you've never heard Jamie Sammons before, first of all, uh, what the hell are you doing with your life? Second of all, 
uh, you can find both her and her uh, also lovely and talented husband, uh, Brian Sammons, uh, in Horror in the House of Sammons. That is correct. And uh, so I'll do this again at the end, but make sure people know where they can find that. Uh, you can find that pretty much anywhere. Uh, we are uh, an independent, so we are work off Anchor, which then sends our feed to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, you know, all of those other ones that I can never remember the names mm-hmm. of. But pretty much any place that you like to listen to your podcast, you should be able to find us. And if you can't, then you can go directly to anchor.fm and look for Horror in the House of Salmons. And we are there. And we just released a brand new episode yesterday. So Excellent. There you go. Uh, yeah, and that reminds me, the Dark Parade now on Pot Sniffer. <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'd like to apologize for all those people who don't listen to <laughs> what you're watching because they don't want to hear my cackle. Then, too bad. Yeah, yeah. So, right. I mean, that's the other thing. If you're listening to this, you've you've heard an episode of what you're watching by now. Uh, and if you haven't, that is all right. Look, I can't promise what's going to happen in this episode. What I can promise you is every episode of what you're watching about an hour. That's all. Um, and I, I don't, again, hard to predict because we, we've got a lot to talk about here. Uh, but, uh, like the last episode that we did of this show is like 45 minutes long. So, you know, we're not go we're not trying to break any records here, Jamie, is what I'm saying. We don't, we don't have to make a three hour show. Um, we'll see how this all goes, but, uh, one never knows. One, one does never know. Uh, it's, that's why they call it a present. Jamie, because every moment is a gift. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um. So let's get into this. <laughs> uh, I like to ask this in the upfront. Um. Did you see? You saw last night in Soho in the theaters, right? Did I you? haven't even seen it. What? <laughs> I'm kidding. I was like, this is going to be a very <laughs> one-sided conversation. <laughs> yes, I did see it in the cinema. Yeah. That uh, that I thought I had remembered that because. If memory serves, and it probably doesn't, um, you really enjoyed it, and you were telling me to see it, and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll see it. Uh, that is, I think, pretty precise. Yeah. Excellent. I think, well, you, I think you nailed it. I did really enjoy it, that's for sure. Yeah, so I did not see it until it hit the home video, and uh, ended up just buying it blindly <laughs> on a 4K because I was like, ah, you know, it's Edgar Wright. I bet it'll be pretty. And uh, and sure enough, oh my goodness, this movie looks so good. Um, yeah. Not, all right, you know, we'll get into the ins and outs of the movie here in a minute. But more than um, the fact that the movie looks really good, which it does, I'm trying to get the guy's name. Did you know, Jamie? The director of photography for Last Night in Soho, he says, stretching his words so he can verify the name. Um, it's it, it's the guy who works with uh, uh, Park Chan Wook all oh. the time. Had done like The Handmaiden. I don't know if he did Thirst. We're gonna find out. Um, but uh, um, is oh my god, I hate this IMDb interface. Um, since they they updated, yes, okay, I agree. It's uh, Chung Hoon Chung is the guy's name, and he did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did Handmaiden? Did Old Boy? Did Stoker? Obviously, did Last Night in in Soho? Did uh, not the second one, but did the first It? Uh, it Chapter One. Um, wow. And also did Thirst, which is maybe my fa- visually my favorite uh, film from Park Chan-wook. If not just my favorite, it might just be my favorite, but I, I, that movie is beautiful. Anyway. That's this, impressive. That is, not, that is quite a pedigree. Yeah, this guy knows how to shoot a movie. That's for damn sure. Um, and anyway... Uh, I, I hope he and Edgar Wright work together again because I thought 
that that collaboration worked out well, if you ask this guy. Um, but all right, so it it the movie starts off with an introduction um, in a very again it's Edgar Wright, so you know take a drink every time I say stylized, but it, it's this really stylized open where you see Thomas and McKenzie who plays Eloise or Ellie uh, in, in the movie um, kind of silhouetted in a doorway and is, you know, lip singing along to uh, some music that's very sixties. Like the sixties influence on this movie is. Inc- oh, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. And she, is, it turns out that she is, applying to this uh, fashion school in London, not to be confused with a dance school in Berlin. But, <laughs> uh, and the other thing we establish in in this opening scene, other than she is very, uh, she's obsessed with the kind of 60s co- couture and, and music, um, but also that her mother is dead, but not so you'd notice because she can see her mother in reflections in the mirror yes so there's something obviously special about this girl um apart from this amazing newspaper dress that she made or magazine yeah i don't remember if it was newspapers or magazines but she made this entire 60s inspired dress out of paper it's stunning the music kicks in it's uh, it's incredible. It just sets the vibe immediately. Mm-hmm. And uh, I happen to also be a lover of 60s, pretty much anything. And I was giddy from the moment this started. I was just like, I don't know what, because I didn't really know where we were going. I was like, I don't know where we're going, but I am so excited to get there. Yeah, right. And it, uh, I think the front end of this movie in particular, like the first hour of this movie is just about flawless for me um because it moves from this you and it, it's a pretty quick scene where you see her getting her acceptance letter um you know her grandmother is asking her like hey are you still seeing your ghostly mother and whatnot and she's like oh no i'm not seeing her anymore and and the grandmother is basically like be careful in london because london is terrible your mother went there and lost her shit and as a result of her losing her shit, she ended up taking her own life. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to see that happen to you. And she's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and while seeing, you know, her ghostly mother reflected in the mirror. She's like, I haven't even seen her in a while. Uh, certainly not now with us in this <laughs> very room. I'm absolutely not looking at her right now. Yeah, but it... it It's interesting to kind of chart all the influences in this movie because it's definitely, there's a ton of Suspiria for sure. There's a bunch of repulsion and this is very shining of like, you have this girl with a a Sean and she is going to move into a place that makes her susceptible to these horrible visions that she'll ultimately see. Um, but I, I like all of that, (laughs) that, that all sounds great to me. So it's interesting to see Edgar Wright do like a straight ahead kind of horror setup. I mean, he, you know, he's done Shaun of the Dead and in, in the series space that he did, there's all kinds of references to horror movies and, and that sort of thing. But this is not a comedy. This is a straight ahead supernatural thriller slash horror movie. Yeah slash mystery uh but yeah and you find yourself embroiled in it and in the way that he flawlessly moves from present day to past and incorporates the two characters that play off each other it i mean the one thing i've always admired about edgar wright is his planning Mm. because you know just take for instance Shaun of the dead which to me is a flawless film. I that to me that film is 100% perfect. There is nothing about it I don't like. And that includes the fact that the second half of the film completely mirrors the first half of the film, not only in like specific scenes, 
uh, where they're walking the same paths and running into the same people and that sort of thing. But also in references, you know, they'll drop a line in the first part of the film and then it's referenced again or comes to play in the second half of the film. And that takes a lot of planning. You can't just sit down and do a stream of consciousness writing and then be like, okay, that's it, we're done. Like, no, he clearly pours over these the, the entire thing and then also during the production. And I think that shows here as well. Everything oh. is for a reason. Nothing is, is just a gratuitous or unused or unnecessary. You know, I, I feel like everything he does is to lead you to a specific thing. And he also happens to do it with a hell of a lot of style and flair. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so Ellie goes to London, despite the warnings of her grandmother about all the bad men there. And right away just has the grossest taxi driver in the world. It's just like, oh, yay, you pretty little thing, you. You know, <laughs> it's real gross. And she ends up getting getting out of the taxi early and this is her first encounter with john um who is uh a guy that also attends this fashion school who at first looks like eh, i mean he seems like a nice enough guy but he's kind of hanging out on the stoop and coming out of the cab with you know hansy mcgee and whatnot uh, it's pretty clear that she doesn't want any part of this and, uh, in fact, he, he says, do you need some help? And she, you know, Ellie kind of shuts him down. He's like, well, you look like you need help. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, th she goes to her dorm room where she meets, uh, her roommate, Jacosta, who is, uh, a delightful kind of jerk of a roommate, um, who immediately like starts smoking in this room where they're not supposed to be smoking and has this uh, like a sort of get to know you conversation with her where she's like, well, you know, uh, obviously you made those clothes because look at them, you know, like there's a real, hey, you're a country mouse kind of situation here. Yeah. And it reminds me of um, remember Pretty in Pink where the girl's like. Where did you even get those clothes? The five and dime store. <laughs> <laughs> but she made her own clothes. You know? Yeah. And right. It, and this Jocasta is just being a complete jerk about it. And when she finds out that Ellie's mother has died, she was like, oh, I knew we would find something in common. And it turns out Jocasta's mother died of leukemia but she kind of broadcasts that you know she's like i'm going to hand out m the story of my dead mother like a business card just to shock people and maybe gain a little sympathy but she's also like you know uh, corralling all the other girls on this floor uh to do shots and like we're gonna go out and hit the town and that kind of thing and um and that's just kind of not who ellie is you know. she's, uh, she has a very friendly, bubbly personality, but she's also, well, I mean, I think honestly, Country Mouse is not, uh, if, if you don't use it in the derogatory sense, it's, you know, it kind of describes her well. You know, she's, she's perky, but she's also kind of quiet. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't, she's not the kind of girl who like goes out to raise hell. Right. Right, and it, and when they do drag her out uh, into Soho, which is a terrific shot of, you know, the busy streets of Soho with all these people out partying, and um, they go to uh, a local pub, and at a certain point, Ellie excuses herself uh, to go to the bathroom, and this is where we get a scene where Jocasta and and some of the other girls. Uh, come into the bathroom and don't realize that she's in one of the stalls and just trash talk her for a little bit about how, oh, I I, I thought, you know, she was going to show up in overalls and ju just being generally shitty people uh, about this girl just because she is not, 
you know, she's not a, a, a city girl. She's not out there to party. She's not out there. Like, she came to this school to do design, and she has a very distinct idea of what kind of fashion she wants it to get into and what she wants to wear and that sort of thing. And they are immediately dismissive of her. Um, and we also get an early look at Terrence Stamp, who is, uh, I think he's credited as the silver haired man who just kind of haunts the movie until we get more of a scene with, you know, here, here's who he is and, and what's going on. Um, and all of this kind of ends up with Jocasta bringing a dude back <laughs> to the dorm where they fuck. And, uh, while Ellie's trying to sleep in the next bed and, uh, anyway, there's, uh, another uh, encounter with John. Uh, she like leaves the the room, and there's a party going on. And and this dude John uh, turns out has taken her coke uh, that she wrote her name on, and they kind of chat for a little bit. But basically, Ellie just you know throws a blanket over herself, listens to music in the corner, where she falls asleep and wakes up and is almost late for school the next day. Um. But, but this leads to her deciding, fuck all of this. I need to find a place where I am not pressured to go out, where my roommate isn't trying to get pregnant in the bed across from me. Uh, so she goes to the home of Mrs. Collins, or Miss Collins, played by Diana Rigg. The incredible Diana Rigg. Oh my goodness, Jamie. And... She basically says, I, you can rent this room. I want two months up front uh, and, and the last two months rent as well. Because she says, sometimes the girls just pick up in the middle of the night and leave. And, and perhaps there is some explanation of why that might be. <laughs> given all the ghostly behavior going on in this home. But uh, anyway... Uh, she also has some rules like you can't have boys in here ever, ever, ever. Uh, some other rules, but that's really the big stuff. And takes her to this like kind of upstairs little nook of an apartment uh, or bedroom, really. It's, uh, you know, shared bathroom and that kind of thing. And, um, and, and that's it. And so she moves in. Yeah, and it seems like it's going to be great. You know, she she loves the the little apartment you know it's her own and i can imagine you know she's right in london it's you know she's got her own little spot it's a nice quiet little place a safe place you think you know i'm and she's on her own so that would be a very exciting time there is such a great shot when she first uh goes to bed in her new room there is this incredible shot of her throwing the sheets over her head uh -huh. and then the camera pulls back from her and you know it, it suggests that the bed is i don't know 30 yards long but you know it's just this wonderful shot of uh you know the reds and blues of the neon flashing in the window behind her as as we're pulling back and she falls asleep and she wakes up and only it's the 1960s and right. she like steps out of her apartment and wouldn't you know it it is soho in the swinging 60s the very time that she is most obsessed obsessed with and um there's this whole like tracking shot of her going into this place called the cafe de paris and uh a guy seeing her says oh can i take your cloak and she's like my cloak what are you talking about and then she looks in the mirror and staring back at her is not Thomas and McKenzie who plays Ellie, but Anya Taylor Joy. Who I always think it's funny. And this is how I remember Thomas and McKenzie's name, uh, or at least I did until I, you know, got to know her better. Well, not personally, obviously, but sure. uh, she was also an old, you know, so she's, you know, she's around, but I always, I thought it was funny that Anya Taylor Joy played Thomason in the witch and that's not a name you hear a lot, or at least that I hear a lot. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, and now she plays against Thomas and McKenzie in this film, 
I just thought that was kind of funny. But it helps me rem it helped me remember Thomas and Mackenzie's name. But Anya Taylor Joy, oh, I mean, she's she, a movie star. It, that's she's, just she's that, yes, like it's a classic, glamorous yes. and beautiful, and and well, and in this club, you know, it's surrounded by you know mirrors, which I love his use of mirrors in this film. But uh, it's you've just got mirrors and people dressed so glamorous and it just it's like I guess what it reminds me of is maybe the closest thing here well not the closest thing but maybe something similar here would be like walking into a bunny club in the 60s yeah but almost like eh. reminds me of, of a young Hefner you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm yeah I'm trying to think what the equivalent would be maybe like like a more glamorous version of like CBGBs or something like that. Okay. Or, yeah. Um, or um, you know, I'm just trying to think of like what what was the height of glamour at at the time, and also just like you know, the, this is where the 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 pulse of the city is beating. You know, mm -hmm. it is just it's young people dressed well you know, having the time of their lives. And I mean, it, it's just gorgeous. It, it's one of those things, uh, you know, I, I talk about this a lot of movies that you just want to kind of live in. And this moment, uh, before things go real south on uh, on poor Anya Taylor-Joy in this movie, um, it, like, this is the world that you would want to live in. Like, she, she walks in and has this air of confidence about, like, I'm going to sing here one day. And uh, this is where she meets uh, Jack, who is played by Doctor Who's own Matt Smith, and who is great up front. Like this whole sequence of them meeting for the first time. Oh, is... and the dance that they, you know, when they dance together for the first time. I just, I love that moment. And I love Matt Smith. So I'm just like, oh, like this is amazing. This is incredible. And I didn't even realize he was in it. Um, really the only two people I knew that were in it was well I saw uh, Thomas and Mackenzie I didn't realize who she was at the time but then Anya Taylor-Joy yeah. and that's it so I didn't know that Matt Smith was in it I didn't know Terrence Stamp was in it and honestly I don't think people talk about him being in this enough he usually gets left out mm -hmm. and um, so when Matt Smith showed up I was like oh shit awesome you know and then he fits perfectly in this time period like I think that you know in his suit and everything like he just looks like he belongs there and he's so confident and he's so friendly and when he like uh, defends her honor at what point i like it's just i don't know i i just you love him you immediately fall in love with this character you know somebody made the point that when this guy because as they're dancing um jack leaves for a second to go get a drink for uh, Sandy is uh, Anya Taylor-Joy's name. And this guy comes up and wants to dance with her. And given what you learn about Jack and what he does, the fact that this guy wants to dance with a girl that Jack is with is not crazy by any stretch. Like, if this guy knew Jack and knew that he, you know inhabited this club or haunted this club that calling uh, Sandy a whore is also not the craziest thing no and you're you're absolutely right and so that was I think that that was clearly a misdirection for us which worked for me to be honest but yeah if yeah. you think about it hard enough then you'd think yeah they probably know and it wouldn't be out of bounds but but it's this like really uh, in, that mo in that moment, you know. Yeah, you but accept it. <laughs> there's this like great kinetic camera work where, you know, uh, Matt Smith punches this dude in the face for calling Sandy a whore, and he grabs her by the hand, and they run out into the streets and end up kissing in this phone booth, and it, you know, it, it's just this wonderful like whirlwind, exciting, romantic, uh, like a Hollywood moment. meet cute. You know very much so it almost it, it feels like the beginning of a musical or something yes yes 
And, and there is a lot of music in this film and uh, a lot of musical scenes. So it that's exactly what it feels like. It's like it's, they ripped something out of Singing in the Rain or something. You know? Yeah. And just at the moment where you know things are getting hot and heavy in the uh in the in the phone booth uh mckenzie i don't know why i call her mckenzie uh, ellie wakes up and then you know when she goes to school she starts creating this like pink dress that she saw sandy in in her vision and also surprise surprise she's got a hickey <laughs> so, so you know ghost hickeys is what we're dealing with in this movie and and it but so she can't get back to sleep fast enough you know like she just wants to fall back into into uh this world and um there the next scene of sandy and jack is him showing up late to pick sandy up and he's got a great lie to where she's like you know, you're not just like, you're very late. And he's like, I've got a feeling you're going to forgive me. And he takes her to not the Cafe de Paris, but takes her to this place called the Rialto. And he says, look, I know it's not the Cafe de Paris, but if you want to sing, you can do that here. Like the Cafe de Paris is really for established singers and that kind of thing. You can get a break here at the Rialto. And this is where uh, Sandy gives an absolutely haunting version of the song Downtown as Matt Smith and a bunch of dudes in suits watch her perform a cappella uh, to, you know, do this uh, audition. But it's insanely good. Oh, yeah. And I love that song anyway. It's just one of those songs that... You hear it and, well, I mean, I guess it won't affect everybody that way, but when I hear it, it immediately transports me places. And it's just, you know, I, I was singing along. I was just, I was all into this and I, it's a perfect song for that. But also it's all about downtown, which it, these are all the things that she's experiencing for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, and the song kind of lays out what downtown is like. But in a very whimsical manner. But this version of it is so very different from the radio version or the the, the version that ever, the original version that everyone knows. But it's beautiful. Yeah, it it's an incredible scene. Like, and, this, and Anya Taylor Joy did her own singing for this movie. This is actually her singing. She's got a great voice. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of it, uh, you know, some old bastard just crawls out of his chair and says all right she can sing and <laughs> and so uh we we come back to the present where ellie has decided to dye her hair blonde like uh sandy's in her dreams and um there's a little bit of business with like jacosta uh seeing that the teacher is kind of really into the designs that Ellie is doing and mm -hmm. being kind of pissy about that. And, uh, she gets a job working at this local pub. Um, and the, this is where you get Terrence stamp kind of following her and seeming more menacing in this moment. Cause he's, he's like, Hey, are, do I know you? Like, are you, who are you related to? Cause you seem very familiar. And um, he he says he recognizes her uh, because of her hair. And he's like, I'm not trying to pick you up. But everything that he is saying and doing certainly suggests otherwise. <laughs> and, and that's, a, again, one of the nice misdirections of this movie is that very quickly you're starting to get a read on this guy as being like, oh, he's somehow involved. Like maybe, I don't know if that's Jack or not. But he well, that's exactly what I thought. Yeah, and uh, what I was like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Like this is Jack, but now, and he recognizes her because he knew Sandy back then, and she looks like her hair looks like her. I mean, I had all these things going on in my head that turn out to be 
not at all true. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, in, in the movie, it's one of those films that once you know what's going on, you can see how cleverly Edgar Wright has pointed you to towards some of these things. And there's what uh, we'll get to this on the, the back end of, of the movie, but there's a couple of shots in particular where Edgar Wright is clearly trying to throw the audience off. Um, but yeah. So but I don't think he does it in a, I don't think he does it in a disingenuous way. As far as I don't think he does anything that when you get to the end of the film, or if you go back and watch it again, that you're gonna be like, "Oh, you fucker," you know, like, or he didn't cover his ass. You know, whenever, um, whenever a filmmaker tries to lead you, uh, the age-old example is the Sixth Sense. You know, if yeah, you, yeah, yeah, once you get to the end of the Sixth Sense, if you go back and watch that film again, everything works. It all fits, and he he it was impeccable. And I, that's how I felt about this film. Like nothing, even though I see what like the tricks he was pulling and what he was doing, I don't think he did it in a way that didn't work. I think that we all came to the conclusions that we were coming to as the movie was going along in a very honest way, just because that was the information we were given. And so we were kind of working off what we were given, but then, you know, if you go back and watch it again, I don't think it falls apart. And that's important to me in a film like this and i think he did it really well yeah yeah absolutely um yeah i yes I, when when he is trying to throw you off the scent it feels more playful of just like uh you know if you're if you're paying attention there are definitely indications in the movie like there are nods to here's what's really going on right but it, it's you know, it's just a director who's like, hey, I know this is a mystery, but if you figure it out, that's fine too. But I'm not I'm not going to lead you there, but I'm also going to make sure that the, the breadcrumb trail is there it's, as well. It's it's legit. Yeah. And it, that does, that's the kind of film that I do enjoy watching multiple times. Because the first, the, the second time I watch it, I go through and see if they trip themselves up anywhere. And mm. then <laughs> the, uh, and then on subsequent watches, I just start to pick out, you know, little clues that were laid along the way. Like, would I, would I have thought this? Because there are things that happen in movies like this where when you see it the first time, you don't even necessarily think anything about it. It might be something that seems completely innocuous. And then when you go back and watch it again, you're like, oh damn it was right in front of me the whole time <laughs> you know? yeah yeah it's yeah there are a couple of anyway we'll we'll talk about it on the back end. but so when ellie goes to bed to get back into this dream world of sandy and jack you know so far in the movie it has been like romantic and glamorous and and wonderful it, and this time she goes to the rialto where a show is is being performed but Sandy is not headlining this show. Um, she is just a backup dancer for this woman who is performing as a marionette and uh, backed up by a bunch of dancing wind-up dolls, which, again, you know, a little on the nose, but I'm okay with it. Um, Can I just tell you how fucking gorgeous she looked in that costume, though? Oh, oh my, my goodness. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was... I just, I was mesmerized. And there were several dancers on the stage, but the only person that I was drawn to, and obviously she's the star of the film, so it makes sense, but the only person that I just couldn't tear my eyes away from Anya Taylor-Joy in that scene, because she was stunning. I mean, she's stunning through the whole film, but in that particular costume, I was just like, Oh my god you know it, right. it was it was crazy yeah I, how good she was uh, you know i like i know i'm repeating myself but it's just one of those things of like oh you're you're a movie star like you you can act and and that's the thing that makes Sonya taylor joy uh so frustrating is that not only is she beautiful and she can sing but she's also a very good actor and it, like she's just like if you were going to write down on paper all of the things that you need to have an honest to goodness movie star she has all of it and it's it's incredible and yes yeah, seeing her dance and sing and all that stuff in this movie as well as you know sort of play these dramatic moments she 
you get, yes, you can't take your eyes off of her in almost any scene she's in. And it's, it's amazing. She's genuinely one of the, like, I, I don't know how she's already not a bigger star, even though she's a big star. Um, and I think she's... She does keep popping up places, though. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that for her. She's in something I saw the other... Oh, she plays uh, in Emma. She's in Emma. Yeah. And uh, I was like, ah. Oh. Like, <laughs> she's... And, I, and it, that makes me happy. Whenever I see someone like this, that... Um, because the first time I ever saw her was The Witch. Mm -hmm. And she was amazing in that and then split and she was amazing in that you know so it just and i've never seen a performance of hers that didn't just wow me and i'm like she's gonna be well and in, in in the witch it's such a niche film i didn't say much, i didn't think much of it at the time but then when i saw her in split i'm like this girl has a career ahead of her she is going to be huge and i really think she is i think she's just gonna she <sighs> I, th I think she, I mean she's just she's gonna blow up. I know it. Yeah, I know I, it. I think the movie that's gonna do it is Furiosa. Um, you know what? Yeah, because that's gonna have a huge mainstream appeal, mm -hmm. and it's big budget and. It, uh, yeah, it's her and Chris Hemsworth and you know George Miller directing again, coming off of Fury Road, and everyone's gonna want to see it. I that's the movie I think that's just going to be. Oh, you're the biggest thing in the world. Um, at any rate, yeah. So enough to borrow a more 60s term i guess she's she's gonna be an it girl she, she kind of already is I, absolutely absolutely yeah there there just isn't anything she can't do and it's it, you know it's one of those things that as i get older i'm just disgusted by it you're just like you're so you're so young and beautiful and talented i hate all of it um <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got your whole life ahead of you, you disgusting young woman um anyway so when we go back to this marionette dance and it's it, you can see on ellie's face that she's like wait a second this isn't how this was supposed to go like i had she's supposed to be a star she's supposed to be singing on the stage and all these men around her it's a great shot because like she is in her you know bed clothes uh watching this performance surrounded by a bunch of men in business suits and um it, at the end of it uh at the performance sandy um basically uh, you know wants to take off and she's like this isn't what i wanted the, the, this isn't what i wanted at all and jack is like Oh, yeah, right. So he, they, he, she ends up going to a table where Jack is sitting. And there's a dude at the table that's like, I want to dance with your date. And he's like, I don't have a problem with that. You don't have a problem with that, do you? And that's kind of the point where she turns her back on him and, and tries to run off. But it, the way that they, like, the camera is following her. And even though she's trying to leave the club... Every time she opens a door, she ends up getting deeper into the club. And it's this really, like, horrifying labyrinth where she, st like, the camera starts swinging left and right like you're looking through her eyes. And, like, mm -hmm. there's one, uh, one of these marionette girls is blowing some dude. Another one's doing coke. Another, or one's doing heroin. There's one that's just passed out, and this woman's trying to wake her up. I mean, it's just all the hideousness of like, oh, this is what this life really is. These are all just prostitutes, you know? Yeah, or the, I mean, or she w went to, uh, well, she started out in what would be like the London version of Hollywood glam and then ended up in the seasoning house. And here's yeah, like, yeah, right. You're like, what the fuck? And so is she. And I love that that it's such a great metaphor, too, for as she's getting deeper and deeper into the club, she's getting deeper and deeper embroiled into this lifestyle without even realizing that she's doing it. You know, this is not something that she consciously chose. This was not the direction she thought she was going. 
and not the direction she wanted to go at all. And then she just keeps getting in deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is, that's how things happen to people and it's tragic. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're in a position you didn't want to be in before you even realize you're there. Yeah, well, she, she finally gets out, she makes her way home, and then you see her look at the, the foot of her bed where there is this guy coming towards her. Uh, you know, to do a little hubba hubba. And <laughs> Ellie screams and kind of wakes herself up. But the implication is that, you know, if it wasn't assault, it was definitely, you know, close to it. Um, and anyway, so Ellie, now that she has this, like, terrible uh, vision of what happened to Sandy in her bedroom, is now, like, disgusted with the dress that she's making. And uh, I like the fact that her teacher is like, look, just keep your shit together, all right? Like, a lot of these jerks that are in this class aren't going anywhere you're going somewhere if you can just not be crazy can you not be crazy can you hold it together um you know you've got a lot of talent etc cetera, etc cetera. uh but you know she is obviously not having a great time with any of this um especially because like when you go back the next time in in one of her dreams you see that you know, Sandy has become exactly what you hope she would not, which is, you know, it's a, and I love the scene. It's so well done, but it's just her at uh, a booth in this club with a bunch of men asking her, you know, so what is your name? And she says, it's Alex, it's Lexi, it's Anna, it's all these different names. And uh, also, we get uh, this guy show up in uh, in the booth and is like, no, no, no. What's your real name? And she says, well, it's Sandy. And uh, she kind of sniffs out like, are you a cop? And he's like, well, you're just too good for this. You know, and there's this glimmer of hope for just a moment in this movie where you're like, yeah. maybe he's going to help her out. Like, maybe that's the direction this movie is going to take. But no, no, no. In, instead, she is just going to continue to drink and start doing drugs and continue to be uh, what it, I mean, essentially, it's just a, a very uh, well-regarded prostitute within the Rialto. And um, so it's, oh, it's just so, oh, and th that whole scene ends with, uh, you know, because throughout the movie, you're seeing um, Thomas and Mackenzie reflected in the mirror and so forth. Which, by the way, was all, to your point earlier, was all done... I think they said there were two instances where that was not practical. You know, that... Wow. Yeah. That for the most... That's some damn good filmmaking, because mirrors are hard to work with. And especially scenes where, like, you'll have a shot where... You have, you know, Ellie reflected in uh, in the mirror opposite Anya Taylor-Joy. And the camera will move around and then all of a sudden there's Ellie as the central character. And, but then Anya Taylor-Joy is now being reflected. And, you know, in, in some of the commentary... Uh, Edgar Wright talked about how it was like the old duck soup thing of you make it look like a mirror and then you match up the motions and that and that right, sort of thing. Right, yeah. But, I mean... But they did it so well. It's shocking. There, There's one shot in particular of her sitting at her vanity where it starts with Ellie's reflection, then the camera pulls back and you realize that it's Anya Taylor-Joy in the seat and then the camera moves around and then it's Ellie again. And I, I think that was one of the few times where they were like, oh, we're matching the shot here or something. But it's like, I, you know, I, I know I called it kinetic earlier, but that's what it is. It's just like the camera is always in motion in these scenes, uh, especially when you go back to the 60s and in the room and that kind of thing. And 
you know, it's constantly revealing one of those characters somehow. And it's so good. It's just, it's one of those things that when you're watching a movie that's, you know, directed within an inch of its life, you're, you're just like, man, I see so much garbage and this is what a real movie looks like. And sometimes I forget that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that scene that you were just talking about where, you know, you match up the actors or you match up the movements um, because you have Thomas and McKenzie on one side of the mirror and Anya Taylor joy on the other side. I want to say, and I could be remembering this incorrectly, but I want to say that after I saw this movie, I was looking, you know, looking into it. And I think it's the Weasley twins who are playing the, yep. um, the clo is that right? Okay. That's, that, yeah, um, that's how they did that. Is yeah, that one of so yeah. fucking great. It's yeah. so clever, you know. And then yeah, they got these two twins, and actually they're you know fairly well known twins because of the well, I only know them from the Harry Potter series, I think. But that's such a cool idea. It's um, you know, we'll get. I mean, and I, I know other people have done it. It's it's an age old trick, but it just when you pull it off as flawlessly as they did, it deserves recognition. Like, no, you didn't invent that trick, but you sure as hell did it right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy good. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I love that whole sequence. It's it's so good. Uh, this descent of Sandy into this, you know, dark underbelly of London is so much fun. And... Um, Do you know what this movie is? What? Showgirls. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> I mean, and uh, obviously that's, there's, there's, my, my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek there because, you know, Showgirls is not uh, the film that this film is. But I mean, just think about the idea, you know, girl goes to Vegas, she wants to be a dancer, she's got, you know, she's got all these plans ended up working in a strip club but then she finally does climb her way up to where she wants to be and where she thinks she wants to be is not at all what she thought it was going to be mm -hmm. like, i don't know i think there are a lot of similarities there yeah absolutely it's uh it's so good. you're right you're right and it's like there's a weird blend of like don't look now uh is in this movie to some degree um yeah it it you know there's a laundry list like when you're listening to the director's commentary which i recommend it's really interesting but there are so many moments where uh you know edgar wright will say oh this shot is something that i kind of lifted from this louis uh, buniel movie that this is the last shot of one of his last films and that kind of thing it's just like oh this guy has such a vast library of cinematic knowledge and being able to kind of put all of that together and and have it not not just put it together but have it like hang together really well and be really captivating and interesting and beautiful and all of that stuff it's it's impressive like Edgar Wright's just a great director I love Baby Driver I know some people weren't big on that movie I thought that movie was great unfortunately I haven't seen it and I I did want to see it it I didn't actively not watch it I just haven't gotten around to it but I've heard nothing but good things it's really good you really? should yeah you should check it out Baby and i've that his use of music in that film is astounding too um is what i hear but yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. it's if you think the the music is good in this movie baby driver is oh it's so good damn that movie's fun i need to go back and watch that i the only reason i haven't is just because there's a central kevin spacey performance in that that like that movie came out just right before the troubles came with Kevin Spacey. And I just haven't revisited Cause I'm like, uh, I just don't want to be thinking as I'm watching baby driver about how much Kevin Spacey sucks as not as an actor, just as a person. Yeah. Stuff like that doesn't bother me though. Uh, then you'll, know. you'll be fine. I, I, I have, it's just distracting. You know, it's not like I can't enjoy the movie, but every time he pops up on screen, I'm like, ugh. You're gross. Anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's true. That is true. But um, I don't know. Like, I not too long ago watched American Beauty again. I'm like, oh, my God, this movie's so good. Like, even though particularly that movie, if you watch it, then you're like, ugh. Yeah. Um, but, the, you know, I don't know. The, the film itself is so damn good that I just, uh, plus, I just love him. I, 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 I 
can't help it. He's a good actor. You know, yeah. he's a damn good actor. So, yeah. But I can totally get why uh, people would want to avoid that. It just, I'm just, I just don't. But yeah. it, it, it's all of that stuff is super tricky. It's just like, eh, you know, every, your mileage may vary. That's just how it goes with all of that stuff. It's, can can you separate art from artist and, and that kind of thing? Um, we are a house full of household. There's two of us. We are a, <laughs> we are a household of Lovecraftians, yeah. uh, particularly Brian. And so it's kind of a it's kind of a have to kind of thing to be able to separate the art from the artist when it comes to him because yikes yeah <laughs> yeah but, for sure you know um but yeah so ellie uh is starting to get more and more caught up in her dream world and uh john her you know would-be boyfriend is like, hey, how about you come out to this Halloween party? Uh, and she decides, especially after, like, every time she goes to sleep, like, the visions just get worse and worse and worse. So she decides she's going to go with them to this Halloween party where, like, Jocasta and all the, the fashion uh, students are hanging out. They're dressed up like the girls from the craft, by the way, which is kind of fun. Um and and then it's just you know a big party and in the middle of it though ellie starts seeing these you know visions of ghostly men that took advantage of sandy and starts seeing sandy as well you know it's starting to bleed into her real life and she freaks out and john says well do you want me to take you home and she says yes but you're gonna have to be quiet because Miss Collins does not allow men in the house. Um, she has a weird thing about it. It's strange. I don't know why. She's really anti-men. Uh, but he ends up going with her to her room. They make out a little bit. And then she starts seeing this vision of Sandy being assaulted by Jack in that bed. And, and ultimately stabbed to death. And so she freaks out, starts screaming. Miss Collins comes up to find, you know, Jack, not Jack, but John desperately trying to get his pants on so he can <laughs> flee the scene. I feel so sorry for that kid. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. He's like, yeah, he's such a good guy. And he's like, oh, my God. Yeah. And so he gets kicked out by Miss Collins, like the, uh, this mirror gets shattered and that kind of thing. And uh, Diana Rigg uh, says, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Just, you know, clean that up and we'll we'll discuss all of this in the morning. And and so the next day she goes and, you know, apologizes. Ellie goes to apologize to Diana Rigg. And while she's doing it, though, she says, look, I have to ask you this. Did anybody die in this room? <laughs> and Diana Rigg has this amazing line where she says, this is London. It's London. Yeah, every, every house, every room, someone has died in. Um, and she's like, oh, I guess you're right. But, uh, you know, if you want to make me happy, Jamie, one of the things you can do in your movie is have a research scene where you go to try to find out the history of the house or whatever. And, yes. and so that's what happens is she goes to the library. Uh... Any movie that has like a microfiche scene or a library research scene, everyone knows that is one of my favorite things in the world. I mean, I just get so excited. The, the mere just mention of of microfiche makes me excited. Um, yeah, it's great. I, <laughs> and and to his credit, uh, John is there with her and is helping her try to find. Um, basically she is looking for some kind of verification that Sandy was killed in that bedroom. Um, but surprisingly, Jamie, it's really just a lot of stories of men who went missing and were presumed murdered in the sixties. Huh? Yeah. I wonder why. Seems weird. Yeah. And, and sure enough, uh, speaking of men, a bunch of ghost men start showing up all over the library <laughs> Uh, forcing Ellie to run from them 
and at one point grab a, a pair of wicked looking scissors and is gonna stab one of these ghost dudes in the face but John catches her arm just in time because she was about to stab Jocasta in the face as it turns out which that'd be okay yeah well you know it, it she's not a great person does she disturb does she deserve scissors to the face eh, I'm not sure about that but uh, but she all right so Ellie does the thing that makes the most sense but also you know it's not going to get her anywhere which is going to the police and so she goes the thing that we're always yelling at people to do in movies just go to the police go right. to the police but you know what are they going to do yeah what they do is they're like um so did they slip you a mickey during this halloween party do you think that maybe you just got all hopped up on the goofballs and that's why you were seeing all these ghosts and stuff and she's like no i mean i don't think so but no i like i saw that i was seeing all this stuff beforehand and you have to find this guy jack because he's the one who got away with killing uh sandy and they're like you know here's kind of the thing we need is last names because we don't know jack and we don't know sandy <laughs> And, um, so she gets no help from the police and then she decides like, I've got to, I've got to take care of this myself and I'm going to start by accusing the old man, AKA Terrence Stamp, who comes into the pub of, of killing, uh, Sandy. And, and she does, she, you know, she's like trying to record uh, a secret confession like it's an episode of the jinx or something and when she she brings up the girl sandy and he says alex killed sandy and she says that whatever happened to her was something that she got herself into and he also says he's sick and tired of this young woman accusing him of being a murderer and he's just gonna you know take his patronage patronage elsewhere and so he just tries to leave, but Ellie uh, chases him, follows after him, is like, no, I know it's you. Um, but in one of the great twists of the movie, uh, he is telling her, like, you've got it all wrong, and then just gets hammered by a car outside this bar. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a true, like, <gasps> moment. <laughs> Yeah, it's shocking <laughs> seeing old man Terrence Stamp just knocked for a, a loop by a, a car, like head on, and and it kills him. And so uh, Ellie's boss, the woman who runs the the pub, is like calling people for help, and um, Ellie's like, "That's Jack," and she says, "His name's not Jack. His name is Lindsay. He used to be a police officer," and that's. Ah. right and that's when she realizes like oh that was the guy that I saw in the you know the in dream the yeah mm -hmm. that was telling you know Sandy like you don't belong here you're better than this um, but so she goes back to her room and she decides like I am out I'm done I have killed an innocent man uh, I, I've lost my shit. I'm going down the same road that my mother did. And this is going to end up with like either me getting hurt. I just got to get out of here. So I don't keep seeing ghost people. And, um, this is the, the scene though, where Edgar Wright himself points out that he's doing a little bit of misdirection. Cause when John takes her home, and she tells him to wait there. She's like, give me 15 minutes. I'm going to grab my shit. And then you're going to drive me home. And the camera pans up to the room, you know, that she's been staying in. Like, oh, the, all the all the evil shit is there in the room. And then when she walks in, the shot is from the stairs looking down at her. Again, the implication being the real terror is what's waiting up in that room. Meanwhile, the real terror, as we are about to find out in this movie, is Mrs. Collins, who invites Ellie in for some tea and some mail. And then as 
Ellie is drinking her tea and sorting through uh, this mail, and she realizes, oh, there is a letter addressed to Miss Collins. Oh, her name is Alexandra Collins. Huh. That's what mm-hmm. Sandy told Jack her name was short for. And Diana Rigg gives this incredible monologue that's all about, like, oh, uh, you know, when you asked me if someone had died in that room, somebody actually did die in that room, and it was me. That uh, every time a man came in there and had his way with me, I died a little more. And so what I did is I decided at a certain point I was going to turn the tables, starting with Jack. And uh, she says, basically, she comes clean. Like, she has not only did she kill Jack, she has killed any number of men and buried them in the floors and walls of this house. And so uh, she says... You know, I know you're not going to tell anybody what I've done here. And Ellie's like, no, I wouldn't. I would never do that. And she's like, no, no, no. I know you won't tell anyone what I've done here. And then you realize, like, oh, shit, the the tea has been poisoned. And she's going to make it look like, because she sort of knew uh, the story of Ellie's mother, she's going to make it look like it was a suicide because of how crazy she's been acting and whatnot. And, um, yeah, but then, you know, John busts in and, and we're kind of off to the races for the conclusion of this movie. But, man, that monologue is good. Oh, shit. As far as, like, villains revealing their evil plan, one of the best I've seen in a long time. Oh, she's amazing. And, sadly, this was her final role. But... She went out in style because she gave a hell of a performance. She's really, really, really good at this. Um, Yeah, and, you know, she's... She goes to meet John, who, you know, after 15 minutes has decided to come look for uh, Ellie and make sure she's okay. He ends up getting stabbed for his troubles. Um, You know, this all kind of leads up to this big chase up the stairs to the room which is another just incredible piece of filmmaking where you're kind of going back and forth between Diana Rigg and Anya Taylor-Joy, and even the stairs themselves have changed and warped, and it's insane. It's so good. Um, but yeah, so uh, they get up in- into this room, and all of the spirits of the men that Sandy killed... Uh, are you now realize that they were trying to get Ellie to help her or uh, help them um, that they're not trying to get her they're trying to elicit some kind of help so that they can finally you know bring their murderer to justice and um, and sure enough like you know Diana Rigg busts in she sees a bunch of ghosts for a second she's like the fuck and realizes like oh i have become a monster and um she tries to kill herself she tries to you know slit her own throat and ellie ends up stopping her meanwhile by the way the house has caught fire and so you know in the midst of all this scrambling with ghosts and trying to stab yourself and all that kind of stuff the flames are starting to rise and, and so forth. It's really like operatic. And uh, yeah, but uh, so there's a moment where she basically says like, I, you know, I didn't deserve what they did to me. And Ellie is like, no, you did not. And she said, they deserved it. They had it coming. And Ellie says, yes, they did. And Uh, then she allows Ellie to leave and just sits down in this bedroom where she killed, you know, dozens of men seemingly. Oh, they're everywhere. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, um, and I honestly, I love the way he uses these ghost men, particularly at the end. Like it's genuinely frightening Mm -hmm. to know that they're just popping up out of everywhere. And, um, 
And I, I also find myself, it's so interesting because I find myself really torn. You know, obviously I feel bad for Sandy and what she went through. But at the same time, I'm thinking, God, you know, all of these men, like, I just can't imagine every single one of these men is uh, like a straight up asshole or tried to harm her. It's, it's like, how many of them were like businessmen who just are under the assumption that these women are doing what they want to do? You know, and that at, whether that's, you know, just ignorance or like maybe, I don't know, like maybe they're just like, oh, well, if this is your line of work, then I'm paying for it. So I'm not doing anything wrong and didn't didn't have any idea what they were stumbling into, you know. So I don't know. I, I found myself like, oh, like I like I get it. Like I get what she was going through and I get that it was uh, I get her want for revenge but then I'm like you know that guy over there he could have been like a dentist who, <laughs> who just happened to be in London and you know thought he'd have a wild time with a lady of the night and then look what happened to him you know I just... sure yeah I mean you know it uh, like it, the thing that I like about this is it's not just one thing you know it is not just yeah oh, she, she did what she had to do to survive. That's partially true. You know, she got revenge for what had been done to her. But also, like you said, like not, it is hard to imagine that all of these men were, were just completely vile, that they deserve this, you know? Exactly. And, yeah, it's not black and white, you know? Yeah. There, there's, which honestly is, you know, real life. You know, there are a lot of gray areas in real life. And people, justice doesn't always fall on the unjust. So, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's but but I like that about it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it right. It's it's more complicated than most endings for a movie like this. Like just like right. a, like a strict giallo or something like that. Like uh, there's a very you know bird with a crystal plumage kind of vibe to uh, this ending, but that feels a little less emotionally complicated than what Edgar Wright is sort of getting at. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so the, the movie ends with sort of an epilogue uh, where Ellie is uh, putting on or you know, it's a, the student fashion show or whatever. And she turns out that this has all been really successful and uh, she, she got her designs done um, her grandmother and John are there to cheer her on in the audience. Um, all of the girls, uh, except for Jocasta, who kind of keeps her distance and, and continues to be kind of a jerk. Um, <laughs> but like everybody is congratulating her and it, you know, it looks like it's going to be, uh, there's a big bright future stretching ahead of her. And, and then we get, uh, two reflections of ghosts. Uh, staring back at her one her mother who looks on very approvingly and then after her mother disappears we get a look at uh sandy and you know taylor joy staring back at her in the mirror and um you know the, the ellie walks up to the mirror and kind of does the the tap on the mirror like we saw earlier in the film yeah and and that's it and then you're out and end of story um but all right so first let's talk about the cast of this thing and which we have been doing some already but worth saying thomas and mckenzie terrific um as eloise or ellie uh she has such an innocence about her yeah in this film that you just want to hug her you know she's a genuinely sweet kind good person you know and it just yeah you know, uh, you get sucked in to her wonder when she first has her first trip, you know, oh, in at the in the night, and then as things start to get worse and worse, you're on this ride with her, and she's just incredibly sympathetic. Yeah, she she's really good in this. Um, I would like to point out Michael Ajao, who is John, who mm -hmm. the last thing I think I saw him in was in Attack the Block, 
And, oh, that's right. Yeah, he was Mayhem in Attack the Block, and he's really good in this. He's really, like, I, again, you need that character that is sort of outside all of the, you know, uh, the, the big drama of the film, who's just a nice guy who likes this girl and gets kind of swept up into, you know, gets stabbed for his trouble, as I said, but I, he's quite good. Um, yeah, he, uh, another, just a a really good character, a really good guy and juxtaposed against the other like some of the other characters in the film like say Jack, uh, he is just the polar opposite and he's refreshing yeah, that. yeah, he's he's really good um, Terrence Stamp of course, we've, we've shouted him out already, but Terrence Stamp is man, you want to class your movie up, get Terrence Stamp uh in there to to do just that he is like he's got the gravitas and and so forth but he's still just a, like he can deliver a line he's you know like for being an older guy i think he was 82 at the time that they shot this movie whoa what yeah i never would have guessed that right and he just he but i guess it makes sense for him to be that old if this you know um if he was already a police officer in the 60s right but um, he's just so like one of those guys that continues to be a really magnetic kind of actor like he's still so much fun to watch uh so you know general zod still holding it down after all these years <laughs> um who else do we, Anya Taylor Joy? Is that where we are? Did we talk about Anya Taylor Joy enough? Uh, yeah, I mean we yeah, I think we I, I think well at least I know I did. I talked about her at length. Yeah. So. And and Diana Rigg, I mean it's a stat cast. Oh, you know who we haven't talked about that much? Matt Smith. Matt Smith, yeah. Um Oh, what a creep in this movie. I didn't know we I had know. it in him. No, exactly, and that's the thing. That's exactly why I think he was perfect for this role. Because it allows you to... Oh, it's just like um, Bo Burnham in... Um, oh, uh, uh, I want to call it Single White Female, and that's not right. Uh, <laughs> uh, promising Young Woman. Promising Young Woman, yeah. you Because of who he is and how you know him and what you're used to seeing him do, he's perfect for this role because you completely buy into the whole romanticized part of him in the beginning and you fall in love with him yeah like i fell in love with him immediately and i was just like oh my god he's great and then when he when you see who he really is you're like oh shit but it doesn't come off like it's he it comes off completely genuine like that's how good of an actor he is is that he makes this heel turn and you totally buy that too Mm -hmm. So even though that's not something I would ever expect from him, but hell yes, he had it in him. Um, by the way, he was recently in, well, I'll say recently, it was a couple years ago, uh, he was in a movie about the Manson family, and he fucking played Charles Manson. Really? I, yeah, see? That's exactly what I said when I saw, uh, I was watching some YouTube video, and they were talking about cult uh, films about cults, and they mentioned that, and I was like, what? Matt Smith is Charles? No. That can't be a thing. And uh, at the damn straight it was. And I gotta tell you he fucking nailed it. Like all the little mannerisms and the craziness and all of that. He was dead on. And it it just I was blown away. Like he's so fucking good. Wow. As an actor. I mean he's just he's just good. And this this introduced me to how much of a range he has. And then after that was when I watched the Charles Manson thing. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I, so, need, I need to check that out. That sounds pretty yeah. good. It's on Netflix, I think. Okay. Um, All right. I'll give that a whirl. Uh, yeah, he's great. He, he, like like I said, just a, r a real surprise by that kind of range. And, and he's terrific. It's just a great cast. Like, everything, everywhere you turn in this movie there's an interesting actor doing interesting things and boy that is that's a good time when you're watching a movie and this movie comes in uh it's only what hour 50 something like that and which these days every time you know a movie gets released it's like well it's two and a half hours you're getting your money's worth it's like how about we just make it a story and when the story's done you stop telling it exactly <laughs> 
Uh, with, That's when I feel like I've gotten my money's worth. Right. It could, Even if it's 75 minutes long, if I if you've told a good story, then I've gotten my money's worth. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, any other, in, in anybody else in the cast that you feel like we're not doing right by? I mean, honestly, I think everyone was good, but I think we hit all the standouts. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, I also, you briefly mentioned the uh, the design teacher. I really liked her. Just I thought, yes. just thought she was a great character. But uh, you didn't see a lot of her. But what we did see of her, I liked. And yeah, I mean, everyone. It, it was just a stellar performances all around. But we definitely nailed the heavy hitters. I think I don't think there were any that we skipped. All right. Well, let's get into themes then. Um, I, all right, so here's the big one that I kind of teased out of this movie, which is uh, that the whole film, whether it's Sandy or whether it's uh, Ellie or, or whoever, that it's just being haunted by your past in a way that makes it impossible for you to move past it. You know, like Miss mm -hmm. Collins or Sandy get stuck at that place where you know she was done wrong and never moves past it like she can't ever let it go and ellie sees the like the literal manifestation of that even as she is kind of living in the shadow of well your mother went to london and you know thought it was going to be a great time but ended up killing herself because she couldn't handle it and so that is the thing that she is carrying with her and, you know, and, and there's the parallel of these two characters where, you know, uh, she wants Sandy to succeed because, you know, it it's fashion for Ellie and it's singing for Sandy. But both of them are girls who come to the city to become the person that they think they want to be. And Sandy yeah, is she perverted. sees herself in Sandy, I think, or at least in the beginning, um, you know, as far as having aspirations and going out there and getting it, you know. And I think that when she first is introduced to her in her first dream, it, it, you know, the next day she's so giddy. She can't wait to get back. She wants to, all she wants to do is spend time in this world with her. And I think it's because she relates to her and she feels like this girl is doing what she wants to do. So... It, it's kind of pushing uh, pushing Ellie along you know because she has these dreams and aspirations that she wants to get so she finds herself in Sandy and then of course you know you, you see how things went and it wasn't exactly what she was expecting but but yeah I mean I think she almost sees her as a I don't know an affirmation yeah. That everything's going to be okay. Because when she first got to London, she was very unhappy. You know, her roommate was shitty. The living situation on the whole just was not what she wanted. It wasn't what she envisioned. And then she finally got this place of her own. And, and she was, everything was looking up. Everything was coming up Ellie. And uh, then, you know, things got dark. But, you know, it was like a kindred spirit kind of thing. Yeah. And, and seeing that warp for Sandy is sort of like, well, that means that it could and probably will go wrong for me. Yeah. I mean, you know, even though she was optimistic about going to school and, and doing what she wanted to do, she had that. I mean, like you said, this, this the past of her mother was haunting her at every turn you know that every decision she made or anything t anything happened anytime anything happened that was negative once she got to the city that's you know that thoughts of her mother and what happened to her mother came flooding back to her and you know that there were going to be moments of you know what if i can't do this or what if it doesn't work out or what if it does go bad and then you know she starts to see the downward spiral that sandy was taking and then yeah, it's going to be like, fuck, that could happen to me. You know, not exactly the same, because she's not doing exactly the same thing, but, you know, maybe London truly is a nightmare. You know, her mm -hmm. grandmother told her. Her grandmother tried to warn her, warn her, so maybe she was right. Maybe maybe going to the city 
is going to be the death of you. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's hard enough when you're out there on your own and you're young, uh, but then to have something like that bearing down on you at the same time, you know, it's going to be, and I think that when she did start to act a little crazy, uh, then it was almost expected. Like people expected that of her because look what happened to her mother. So yeah, she's going to be a nut, mm -hmm. which is why if she had succeeded in the suicide plot, uh, if Miss Collins has had succeeded, then everyone would have just believed it. I don't think anyone would have asked any questions. It would have been like, oh yeah, that tracks. Nobody's arguing that it wasn't a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. I it, it's really um you know very much a story of kind of facing your demons in a lot of ways. And that's sort of where Miss Collins is at the end of this movie when you see Diana Riggs sitting literally facing yeah. her demons. Yeah, yeah, sitting on that bed waiting for justice to find her. Um you know, it's it, it's really a kind of a wonderful resolution to it all. Um uh, all right, so let's let's do some ratings and final thoughts here. I'll let me get mine out of the way, and then you go nuts because mine won't take long. Which is, I think the movie is beautiful. I think it is really uh, like the performances are fantastic. It is a visual feast. Every I, I think it's wildly entertaining. My biggest complaint with the movie is I feel like. From, say, the Halloween party to the moment that you get the Diana Rigg monologue, I feel like that is a little bit saggy. It just doesn't have quite the the momentum that the rest of the movie does, and it, and it drags for me a little bit there. Um, but I think that regardless of all of that, it's still like I watched this twice on back to back days and it was by the, every time I reached the end of it, I thought it was terrific. And so my score is a solid four out of five for last night in Soho and I'll shut up. Uh, so you can do your thing. <laughs> well, I actually agree with everything you said, even to the point where it seemed to lull a little bit toward the between the second and third bits not to the point where it took me out of it not even close i was still completely mesmerized by everything you know from all the performances and and the way it looked and the music oh my god i can't say enough about how i think his music choices were just perfect and the lighting even you know the way he purposely called back to a lot of the two jallo lighting you know there are a lot of similarities there and it's not a jallo but you can see the influences there and edgar wright is not one to uh shy away from telling you what his influences are he never he doesn't and that's what i love about him too is he doesn't he never tries to claim anything for his own. He's like, you know, I, look, I got this from here. I got this from there. This is what inspired me here. And that's the kind of filmmaker that I adore is that when they're able to take something um, and, you know, use that influence or even a direct scene, even in their own film, but still come out with something that feels completely original and totally their own. And I, I feel like he did that here. His style is, I think, honestly, this might be, well, like I said, I haven't seen Baby Driver, but to me, this stylistically is my favorite film of his. Like, it just is just candy mm -hmm. all the way through. And for that reason and for the reason that I, I really love the story and the turns and the fact that there was a true mystery that I think worked really well because by the time we got to the end I was I had fallen for it you know I had fallen for Terrence Stamp being Jack I had fallen for to, you know and then uh, when we realized what's actually going on I was just like wow good job um on subsequent watches which there had been several <laughs> because I really really loved it I never it never 
it never gets old. It never gets tired. It's not a it's not a film that I'll be like, all right, I've seen that enough. Like I don't think that'll ever be a thing. So for me, it is. Oh, and one more quick thing. I <laughs> the moment uh, after the first dream sequence, the dream trip or whatever, that was when I understood the title of the film. And let me tell you why. Uh -huh. Because all of the marketing leading up to the film. Um, I'm not saying it led me in this direction. I'm just saying every time I saw a trailer for it, every time, every time I saw the title for it, I thought it meant like, you know, the last night in Soho. Right. The, a final like, hey, night. Yeah. A final, exactly. Final night in Soho. But no, it's last night in Soho. You know, like this is what happened last night in Soho, you know? <laughs> and I, when I was in the theater and I was like, ah. Uh, out loud i was just like oh i get it <laughs> sometimes i'm a little slow in the up jump but <laughs> i i like the fact that you just interrupted everyone's viewing experience to be like oh yeah hey ever at last it's not the last night and so it's la all right i get it everybody go back to watch the movie now. as you were as yeah. you were uh, well, as it happens, we always go to the movies super early in the morning, so I didn't really disturb anyone. There was nobody else there. Sure. <laughs> but um, I just thought that was funny because it just like, oh, I get it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this movie is a straight up five for me. I oh, nice. absolutely love it from beginning to end. And even the bits, and I don't think you're wrong, uh, that kind of slow down a little bit i'm still so in it and so invested that it doesn't it, it doesn't bother me at all and i absolutely love it it's just yeah it's also i had i really didn't it was one of those film viewing experiences where i didn't really know where it was going or what it was going to end up being and in the first part of the film I was just like, oh, well, this isn't really a horror film, but I fucking love it. It's great. You know, and then you get to the end when everything's coming out in the wash and it was like genuinely scary. There were some really good, scary visuals there with the ghosts and everything. And I like the way he used them. So I kind of like that, that it, it, um, like this, it starts out as a film you could show like, oh, like my grandma would love this movie. <laughs> And uh, and then, you know, by the time you get to the end, like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you have a cool grandma, she probably still would, but, you know, maybe not. I mean, who doesn't have a cool grandma? I don't have any grandmas anymore. Oh. But, <laughs> but my, you know what? My grandma was cool, though. She had a huge crush on Chuck Norris. That was hilarious. Yeah. She loved, she watched the hell out of some Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> I think it's the beard. I think, like, grandmas go for, uh, like, the, the Kenny Rogers, the yeah. Chris Christopherson's, yeah. <laughs> the Chuck, Chuck Norris's of the world. Those are all very interchangeable guys, by the way, <laughs> as far yeah. as, like, the, how they look. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you could just have one, one person that's, you know. Uh, uh, but yeah, Chuck I love Christopherson. it. I, I adore it, and um, I, I I was really really pleasantly surprised by how good it was. So, all right, well, uh, Jamie, are you prepared to learn three things that you probably didn't know about last night in Soho? I am. I'm so excited. Teach me. Teach me. Excellent. So, one fun bit. We, we mentioned Furiosa earlier as we were talking about our early predictions for when uh, Anya Taylor-Joy will become the most famous person in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, she was cast in that film right after George Miller saw an early cut of Last Night in Soho oh. and was so blown away by her that he met her immediately and offered her the leading role. Oh my god, wow. Yeah. Uh, pretty good. All right, number two. Um, so <laughs> this is a fun one. Um, so the pub where Terrence Stamp hangs out in the movie is a real pub called the Toucan. And uh, when Edgar Wright was setting up a shot of the stairs of this, the basement of this place, Terrence Stamp said, "Why those stairs aren't fit for the movies?" And so <laughs> the pub 
now has a plaque up on the stairs that says, these stairs aren't good enough to be in a movie, Terrence Stamp. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) So, so good for, good for you people who run the Toucan. That's fun. Um, (laughs) They have a good sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then finally, uh, the library scene, uh, which was uh, filmed uh, in London, um, there were uh, there's a section of the library that's all uh, Asian studies, and Edgar Wright noticed that they had a bunch of DVDs of movies by Park Chan Wook, and so he tried to get Chung Chung Hoon, the you know the the guy who worked with Park Chan Wook, mm-hmm. um, to sign all of the DVDs on the sly. Ah. Uh. Uh, but Did he do it? No, he wouldn't do it. Oh, uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want, didn't want to mess him up, but... That is straight out of Breakfast at Tiffany's. You know where Paul Barjack goes to sign... Or they're at the library, and they find his book in the library, and he starts to sign it in the library, and it's like, What are you doing? Stop it! I've never seen or Breakfast. I talk- I, I've never oh, seen it. Yeah. What? I, I really th- I that surprises me. I really thought you would have. I, I mean, t- not that it's the kind of movie you're going to be all about necessarily, but sure. honestly, I think you. I honestly, you should. All right. I, should. I. I. Yeah. I don't have anything against that. I like uh, Audrey Hepburn as much as the next guy. Uh, George Papard. Oh my God, he's so dreamy in that. But Mickey Rooney aside, I mean, we can all recognize that Mickey Rooney's very racist caricature <laughs> oh right yeah see that's the thing i know most about that movie is is that thing is is the mickey Rooney. yeah thing. fortunately it's a very small part of the film sure it's it really is and the the rest of the film is totally worthwhile so i, I would be interested to see what you think i think you might dig it all right well uh that's uh the three things that you probably didn't know about last night in soho um, I'm so disappointed he wouldn't sign him. That's that's the perfect. That's so perfect. It, it's really good. But I like that Edgar Wright was like, "You, dude, you should totally do it. <laughs> dude, sign it, sign it, dude." <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Jamie, I know we talked about this earlier. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this. You're the best. oh, thank you for having me. I love you know I love doing anything with you. So, um. um I'm not going to ever be like, no. No, <laughs> she said. Um, <laughs> well, and the money doesn't hurt, you know. No, no, no. That's always good. Uh, but where, uh, once more, where can people find more out of you? Uh, not just on what you're watching, available right here as part of the Dark Parade, but um, just, you know, other places, other stuff you do, other people well, you talk to. That it's really these days mostly of uh, Brian and me and uh, over at Horror in the House of Salmons, like we talked about earlier. Although I did recently close up two hanging franchises that uh, for the Skeleton Crew, which it's really, it's not the Skeleton Crew anymore. It's now um, uh, Bare Bones because it's a solo show that Alex from the Skeleton Crew does. But uh, we recently did scream when it came out Mm -hmm. and then we did the new texas chainsaw film when it came out uh with dave because uh we had covered those franchises previously on the skeleton crew so we wanted to kind of wrap that up yeah i need to hear what you thought about the new texas chainsaw yeah (laughs) and so i do things like that on occasion here and there but most of the time you're going to find me in two places and that's going to be um horror in the house of salmons and what you watch it Excellent. Jamie and Pope, whoever Yay. they are. Two fine, upstanding, productive members of society. <laughs> uh, who... <laughs> or at least talky ones. I don't know how productive I am, but I sure do run my mouth. Yeah, out. yeah. I'm actually, I'm very excited because uh, on the next What You Watch, and a little preview of that, I watched, uh, if memory serves, I, I might have this wrong, but I think, I think I'm remembering this right. But I, uh, I watched... Uh, some Blu-rays that you got for me. Huh. That would be interesting to hear. Yeah. So that's a little tease. I think that's right. If I'm not, 
to see if you watched the movie that you were gonna watch that I told you to watch. What movie was that? Ghostbusters Afterlife. Oh yeah, I did watch that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm curious to see. I can't wait to hear about that. And then, uh, yeah, I watched uh, the Studio Six Six Six. We saw that at the theater last. So I'll be talking about that in oh. the new Texas Chainsaw film. And uh, I don't know oh, whatever what a... happens between then and there. This is a good tease. All right. Well, uh, come back for that episode of What You're Watching. Um, and uh, I'll be back in a second to uh, close out the show. Jamie, thank you again. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And there you have it, folks. That is Last Night in Soho. Uh, I Like I said, I had a great time uh, talking to Jamie about this movie. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to Jamie. Like we're, You'll also be getting a What You're Watching this week. Um, so you're, you're getting a, a double helping, a, a one-two punch of me and Jamie just kind of jabber on about stuff. And, uh, and it's always a pleasure when we do. Uh, if not for you, certainly for me, because, uh, as I said in the upfront, she's an old and dear friend and we have a good time. We have a, a, a really wonderful, uh, a time talking about movies and life and everything in between. So, um, I appreciate you listening. As I said, uh, also to reiterate from the upfront, you would be doing me a big favor because, uh, as you may recall, I'm going to be on a boat, uh, when this episode drops. Uh, if you don't mind doing uh, me a solid and uh, take a little extra time maybe today and, you know, rate the show on the podcast catcher of your choice, uh, especially iTunes. That helps a lot. Or uh, go over to the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Legion podcasts, and you can just give a thumbs up on the video version of this. Or uh, if you really want to help, um, throw it in your social media feed, drop a link uh, to the show uh, there and uh, and help share it around. So. Uh, it is much appreciated. I would be doing that kind of thing myself if I were able, but, uh, I will be, um, sailing the seas of cheese or perhaps just water. Uh, I might be a little overly influenced by Primus. It's really hard to say. So we've got more coming up. Uh, the next episode we are going to be doing is also going to be a good one. It's, uh, Derek Bourgeois returning to the show to talk a little over your dead body by Takashi Miike. And I think you're going to enjoy that episode as well. Uh, it is an interesting movie and we are going to get into some, uh, Japanese folklore and that kind of thing. Another, uh, sort of a hero, hero, go show crossover episode. So, um, anyway, thanks so much for listening. Uh, thanks for being part of this community. I hope you're enjoying what we're doing here. And I look forward to talking to you all once I am back from my uh, pirate sea faring adventure. Uh, in the meantime, I will see you next time. And thanks as always for joining the Dark Parade.